I'm Dr. Mark Atala, and I want to welcome you to the 15th chapter of the OpenStax Psychology Textbook. Today we'll be discussing psychological disorders, so what they are, how they're diagnosed and classified, different perspectives on them, and then a number of different disorders. So we might begin by asking what a psychological disorder is. And it's a condition characterized by abnormal thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. Now, psychopathology is the study of psychological disorders, including their symptoms, ideology, which means their causes, and their treatment. And this term psychopathology also refers to the manifestation of a psychological disorder. Now, psychologists work to distinguish psychological disorders from inner experiences and behaviors that are merely situational, idiosyncratic, or unconventional. So perhaps the simplest approach to conceptualizing psychological disorders is to label behaviors, thoughts, and inner experiences that are atypical, distressful, dysfunctional, and sometimes even dangerous as signs of a disorder. So off to the right there, you see some popular characters from Winnie the Pooh and Christopher Robin and labeling their um, <laughs> disorders. Now, atypical means that it deviates from the norm and can signify the presence of a psychological disorder. Just because something's atypical, however, does not necessarily mean it is disordered. So for example, people with red hair are only 4% of the US population, but it's not a disorder, it's just atypical. There's also an issue of cultural expectations. So returning a stranger's smile is expected in the United States because the pervasive social norm dictates reciprocation of friendly gestures. But cultural expectations in Japan involve showing reserve, restraint, and a concern for maintaining privacy around strangers. Um, eye contact in the US and Europe also indicates honesty and attention, but in Latin America, Asia, and African countries, it's rude or confrontational. So when someone makes eye contact, that could be considered appropriate or respectful um, or brazen and offensive, depending on your culture. So violating cultural expectations is not in and of itself a satisfactory means of identifying the presence of a psychological disorder. What about hallucinations? And that's seeing or hearing things that are not physically present. In Western societies, it's a violation of cultural expectations and a person who reports such inner experiences is readily labeled as disordered. In other cultures though, uh, hallucinations about the future may be regarded as normal experiences that are positively valued. And another important thing to keep in mind is that cultural norms change over time. Jerome Wakefield, who's pictured there to the right, defines psychological disorder as harmful dysfunction. And that's the idea that psychological processes such as cognition, perception, and learning have important functions, such as enabling us to experience the world uh, the way others do and engage in rational thought, problem solving, and communication. Dysfunction occurs when an internal mechanism breaks down and can no longer perform its normal function but the presence of a dysfunction alone does not determine a disorder. The dysfunction must be harmful in that it leads to negative consequences for the individual or for others as judged by the standards of that culture. So what about the American Psychological Association? What do they weigh in with? Well, they say there's significant disturbances in thought, feelings, and behaviors, and the disturbances reflect some kind of biological, psychological, or developmental dysfunction. The disturbances lead to significant uh, distress or disability in a person's life. So for example, they may fear social situations, and so they never go out of the house to attend class or get a job and the disturbances do not reflect expected or culturally approved responses to certain events. So for example, grieving over someone's death, um, that's a culturally approved response, so that wouldn't be considered um, a problem. The DSM-5 is uh, all about diagnoses, and that's appropriately identifying and labeling a set of defined symptoms, and it's crucial because it enables a common language among professionals in the field. The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders is now in its fifth edition. So we have the DSM-5, and that was published in 2013. The first edition was published in 1952, and it classified psychological disorders according to a format 
which was developed by the U.S. Army during World War II. The DSM-5 includes information about what's called comorbidity, and that's the co-occurrence of two disorders. So for example, OCD and depression. So 41% of people with obsessive compulsive disorder also meet the criteria for major depressive disorder. Now, the manual is not static. It actually changes over time. And a good example is that being gay was considered a disorder uh, until 1973. Um, and so it appeared in the, as a disorder in the first two editions. And so progress is being made. The International Classification of Diseases, or IDC, is a second classification system, and it's published by the World Health Organization, and it's basically European. Um, it's been revised several times since, uh, approximately 10 times. Categories of psychological disorders are similar in the DSM and the ICD, but the DSM contains um, more explicit disorder criteria, and worldwide, the ICD is used more for clinical diagnoses and the DSM is used more for research. Well, for centuries, psychological disorders were viewed from a supernatural perspective, meaning that it was a force beyond scientific understanding. So people who were afflicted were thought to be practitioners of black magic or possessed by spirits. And one historian has provided a comprehensive explanation. There was a dancing mania epidemic in Europe and he suggested that the phenomena was attributable to a combination of three factors, psychological distress, social contagion, and a belief in supernatural forces. A biological perspective says that, and people agree on this, that most psychological disorders have a genetic component. And there's little dispute that some disorders are largely due to genetic factors. So uh, many psychological disorders develop not from a single cause, but from things that are partly biological and partly psychosocial. And so they've developed what's called a diathesis stress model. And uh, diathesis means disorder, so the disorder, disorder stress model. And it integrates biological and psychosocial factors to predict the likelihood of a disorder. And it suggests that people with an underlying predisposition for a disorder are more likely than others to develop a disorder when faced with adverse environmental or psychological events. Well, let's now start talking about specific disorders. And we'll start with anxiety disorders because that starts with the letter A. Now, anxiety involves apprehension, avoidance, uh, and cautiousness regarding a potential threat, danger, or a negative event. And so anxiety motivates us to take action. Anxiety disorders occur when uh, the anxiety is uh, excessive and persistent fear, and there's related disturbances in behavior. Anxiety disorders are very common. Uh, 25 to 30% of the US population meets the criteria, and they're more common in women than men. Anxiety disorders are the most frequently occurring class of mental disorders, and they have a high comorbidity with other things too. Specific phobias are when a person experiences excessive distressing and a persistent fear or anxiety about a specific object or situation. Um, and that's very common too. About 12.5% of the US population at some point in their life has a specific phobia. Uh, phobia is actually a Greek word that means fear. So for example, agoraphobia is an intense fear and avoidance of situations in which it might be difficult to escape if you experience a panic attack. How do we come up with phobia? How, how do people develop phobias? Uh, some people think it's classical conditioning, modeling, or verbal transmission. And evolutionary theories argue that the brain is predisposed to fear certain things. So for example, spiders, which is arachnophobia, heights, snakes, and thunder. Social anxiety disorder is an extreme and persistent fear or anxiety and avoidance of social situations in which the other in which a person could potentially be evaluated negatively by others. And again, that's about 12% of all Americans across their lifetime. Anxiety uh, comes from the fear that they might act foolish, show anxiety by blushing or doing or saying something wrong. And they often have problems with public speaking, meeting strangers, and eating in restaurants. Um, people with social anxiety disorder also engage in what are called safety behaviors. And these are mental or behavioral acts that reduce anxiety in social situations 
by reducing the chance of a negative social outcome. So they tend to sit on at the back of the room, so they're less likely to be called on in class. They wear bland clothing, so they don't stand out. Um, there's a number of those kinds of behaviors. Panic disorder is for people who experience recurrent and unexpected panic attacks with at least one month of worry about the attacks. Now, a panic attack is a period of extreme fear or discomfort that develops abruptly and reaches a peak within 10 minutes. And symptoms include uh, accelerated heart rate, sweating, trembling, choking sensations, dizziness. Um, but panic attacks are not a disorder. Panic disorder um, is, though, and it impacts about 4.5% of people. So where do these panic attacks come from? And we can discuss neurobiological and cognitive theories. So one theory, or the, a neurobiological theory, uh, focuses on uh, the locus correlia. I'm, I, I don't I can't say that. And that's the brain's major source of norepinephrine. And so it triggers the fight or flight response, and that activation causes panic. Cognitive theories argue that people interpret ordinary bodily sensations catastrophically, and that sets the stage for a panic attack. So uh, catastrophic thinking is a real problem. Generalized anxiety disorder is a relatively continuous state of excessive, uncontrollable, and pointless worry and apprehension. So people worry about routine, everyday things, and these concerns are unjustified. Freud called it free-floating anxiety. So people are just anxious all the time. And about 5.5% of people develop that, with women being twice as likely. And again, as with most of these, genetic factors play a modest role in the disorder. OCD, or obsessive compulsive and related disorders. These are groups of overlapping disorders that involve intrusive thoughts and repetitive behaviors. So someone with obsessive compulsive disorder experiences thoughts and urges that are intrusive and unwanted, and those are the obsessions, and or the need to engage in repetitive behaviors or mental acts, which are the compulsions. Common obsessions that people have are things like germs and contamination, so they wash their hands, order and symmetry, and so they have to like line up pencils so that they're all in line together, and urges that are aggressive or lustful. Compulsions include hand washing, cleaning, checking, and ordering, and um, also mental acts like counting or praying. I had a former student who he clicked a pen one million times when he was in high school and counted every one of the times he clicked it. They're carried out as a means to minimize the distress obsessions trigger. Body dysmorphic disorder is when a person's preoccupied with a perceived flaw in their physical appearance that's either non-existent or barely noticeable to other people. And it typically involves the skin, face, or hair. It leads to repetitive and ritualistic behavior and mental acts, uh, such as constantly looking in a mirror or even cosmetic surgery. Hoarding disorder is when people cannot bear to part with personal possessions, regardless of how valueless or useless they are. Uh, why? Because they think they might be useful later or have uh, sentimental value, and they've built whole reality TV shows about that. What are the causes of OCD? Well, family and twin studies argue for a moderate genetic component, so the concordance rate between identical twins is 57%. The orbitofrontal cortex is an area of the frontal lobe involved in learning and decision making, and it becomes hyperactive in people with OCD when they're provoked. And how do you provoke them? Well, you make them look at a, at a photo or of a toilet or pictures that are hanging crookedly on a wall. PTSD, or post-traumatic stress disorder, is a disorder that occurs after an extremely stressful or traumatic event, such as combat, natural disasters, sexual assault, or auto accidents. Symptoms often include intrusive or distressing memories of the event and flashbacks. And flashbacks are states that can last a few seconds to several days, during which the individual relives the event and behaves as if the event were occurring at that moment. The risk factors for PTSD are trauma uh, experience and severity, the lack of a social support network, subsequent life stress, and other factors include being female, being poor, having low intelligence, and a history of mental disorders. And that's both uh, personally uh, and uh, mental disorders within your family. 
Research has shown that social support following a traumatic event can reduce the likelihood of PTSD. And some models suggest that symptoms are developed and maintained through classical conditioning. So cognitive, emotional, physiological, and, and environmental cues are, uh, essentially serve as conditioned stimuli. There's also cognitive factors. So disturbances in memory for the event and negative appraisals of the trauma and its aftermath. So thing, saying things like, it happened because I'm stupid, may lead to dysfunctional strategies um, in dealing with it. Mood disorders are characterized by severe disturbances in mood and emotions, and it's most often depression, but also mania and elation. The DSM-5 lists two general categories of mood disorders, so depressive and bipolar. Depressive disorders are when people feel sad, discouraged, and helpless, and bipolar and related disorders include mania as a defining feature, and that's a state of extreme elation or agitation. Major depressive disorder is when you have a depressed mood most of the day, nearly every day, and a loss of interest and pleasure in your usual activities. Major depression is considered episodic, meaning that the symptoms are present and then they, they abate, they, they go away with time, and then they come back. Risk factors, around 6.5% of the U.S. population experiences major depressive disorder each year, and it's more common in women, higher rates in North and South America and Europe and Australia. It's higher in younger groups of people, uh, people who are unemployed, divorced, or widowed. Now, there are subtypes of depression, too, and the DSM-5 calls these specifiers. These aren't specific disorders, but labels used to indicate specific patterns of symptoms or to specify certain periods of time in which the symptoms may be present. So seasonal pattern is when a person experiences the symptoms of major depressive disorder only during a particular time of the year. And that's usually during the fall and winter, and it's sometimes called the winter blues, which is that why that sign's up there. Postpartum depression, uh, more properly called peripartum onset, is for women who experience major depression during pregnancy, or in the weeks following the birth of their child, and they often feel guilty, agitated, and weepy. Persistent depressive disorder uh, is when you have depressed moods most of the day, nearly every day for at least two years. Um, so people are chronically sad, but they don't meet the criteria for major depression. Bipolar disorder is uh, mood states that vacillate between depression and mania. And so people go from one extreme to another, not within one day, but it's a pattern of behavior. A manic episode is a distinct period of abnormally and persistently elevated, expansive, or irritable mood and abnormally or, and persistently increased activity or energy lasting at least one week. So people can be talkative, they should have no sleep, they're euphoric, and they have a flight of ideas. So they abruptly switch from one topic to another. One of my professors, when I was an undergraduate 30 years ago, uh, told a story he had a college roommate who, when he was in a manic episode, would type out a letter to every member of the U.S. Congress. And uh, that was when you had to type each letter individually, and he would just go for 48 hours doing that. The risk factors are less frequent than major depressive disorder, but rates are higher in men than in women. What's the biological basis? Well, relatives of people with major depressive disorder have double the risk of developing it, and relatives of people with bipolar have nine times the risk. People with mood disorders often have imbalances in certain neurotransmitters, particularly norepinephrine and serotonin, and so they can take SSRIs, which are medications that boost their activity. Depression is linked to abnormal activity in several regions of the brain, especially the amygdala and prefrontal cortex, which we've talked about already. Depressed people are more prone to react emotionally to negative stimuli and have a greater difficulty controlling those reactions. What about the diathesis stress model here? Well, stressful life events can trigger depression and include significant losses, such as the death of a loved one, divorce or separation, uh, and serious health or money problems. And so life events such as these often precede the onset of a depressive episode. And it's an especially important are what are called exit events, like divorce or death, because it's a, it, there's a finality to those things. 
Likewise, individuals who are exposed to traumatic stress during childhood, such as separation from a parent, family turmoil, and maltreatment, are at a heightened risk for developing depression at any point later in their lives. What are some theories of uh, the cognitive theories of depression? Well, these take the view that depression is triggered by negative thoughts, interpretations, self-evaluations, and expectations. So Aaron Beck, and he's pictured there to the right, he theorized that depression-prone people possess depressive schemas, uh, and that's a mental predisposition to think about most things in a negative way. And so when they talk about themselves, they have a lot of themes of loss and failure, and longitudinal studies have supported Beck's theory. Hopelessness theory postulates that a particular style of negative thinking leads to a sense of hopelessness, which then leads to depression. Rumination is a repetitive and passive focus on the fact that one is depressed and dwelling on depression symptoms. And it's much more common in women than men. Let's talk about suicide for a moment. It's not mentioned as, as a disorder in the DSM-5. However, suffering uh, from a mental disorder, especially a mood disorder, poses the greatest risk for suicide. Around 90% of those who complete their, a suicide have a diagnosis of at least one mental disorder. Suicidal risk is especially high among people with substance abuse problems. So individuals with alcohol dependence are at 10 times greater risk for suicide than the general population. Withdrawal from social relationships, feelings as though uh, that one is a burden to others and engaging in reckless and risk-taking risk behaviors may be precursors to suicidal behavior. The most common months for suicide are April and May, and rates are actually lowest during the winter months. Uh, a lot of people think it's the other way around, but that's what the data suggests. Let's talk about schizophrenia next. Um, it's a devastating psychological disorder that's characterized by major disturbances in thought, perception, emotion, and behavior. 1% of the population experiences schizophrenia, but it's interpreted differently in different cultures. Schizophrenia does not mean having a split personality. Uh, that's dissociative identity disorder. It, it comes from um, schizophrenia has been um, translated as split mind but it's, um, yeah. It's considered a psychotic disorder, which means that people are not able to function normally uh, when they have it. What are some of the symptoms? Well, hallucinations, as we talked about these earlier, those are perceptual experiences that occur in the absence of external stimuli. Auditory hallucinations are the most common, and oftentimes they provide a running commentary or criticism of what's going on in the person's life. They also have delusions, which are beliefs that are contrary to reality and are firmly held even in the face of contradictory evidence. So paranoid delusions are beliefs that other people are plotting to harm them. Um, uh, grandiose delusions are beliefs that one holds special power or unique knowledge. Um, there's people throughout history who thought they were Jesus or they thought they were Napoleon or um, I even know... Um, of cases of people who thought they were Billy Joel, who's a pop singer uh, back in the 70s. Somatic delusions are the belief that something highly abnormal is happening to one's body. So for example, people insist that their kidneys are being eaten by cockroaches. Anhedonia is an inability to experience pleasure. And so they have no interest in uh, normally fun things. Um, as a bit of trivia, Woody Allen, he did a movie called Annie Hall, which won Best Picture, and he didn't want to call it Annie Hall. He wanted to call it Anhedonia. What are the causes of schizophrenia? Well, a couple different things uh, which are proposed. There's a genetic basis because adoption studies show that adoptees' uh, biological relatives have a higher risk for schizophrenia than their adoptive relatives but schizophrenia probably arises from a combination of genetic and environmental factors. In terms of neurotran neurotransmitters, there's the dopamine hypothesis, and that argues that an overabundance of dopamine or too many dopamine receptors are responsible for schizophrenia onset and maintenance. In terms of brain anatomy, the ventricles, which are the cavities within the brain and contain cerebral spinal fluid, um, are too big. And so schizophrenia is associated with the loss of brain tissue. Pregnancy, uh, you're at an increased risk for schizophrenia if your mother was exposed to influenza during 
uh, the first trimester. Let's talk about dissociative disorders now. And those are characterized by an individual becoming split off from their core sense of self. So it's a psychological rather than a physical cause. Dissociative amnesia is when a person's unable to recall important personal information, usually following an extremely stressful or traumatic experience. Some people with dissociative amnesia will experience what's called dissociative fugue. And that's when individuals suddenly wander away from their home, they experience confusion about their identity, and sometimes they adopt a new identity. And there is a tremendous amount of controversy about how many people actually have that. Dissociative identity disorder is when people exhibit two or more separate personalities or identities. It was formerly called multiple personality disorder, and it is also highly controversial. Many times people may fake symptoms to avoid the consequences of illegal activities. And also the number of cases skyrocketed in the 1980s after uh, there was a movie called Sybil, which was largely a fabricated story and the number of cases went up drastically after people saw the movie. People with personality disorders exhibit a personality style that differs from the expectations of their culture, is pervasive and inflexible, begins in adolescence, and causes distress or impairment. Cluster A disorders uh, are odd and eccentric or eccentric behavior. Cluster B is impulsive, overly dramatic, highly emotional, and erratic behavior. In cluster C uh, are nervous and fearful behaviors. So for example, borderline personality disorder is characterized by instability in interpersonal relationships, self-image and mood, as well as marked impulsivity. They cannot tolerate the thought of being alone and make efforts to avoid abandonment. Their relationships are intense and unstable and genetic factors seem to be important in the development of borderline personality disorder. Antisocial personality disorder, and there's the poster child of it. That's, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name. Charles Manson, that's it. People show no regard at all for other people's rights or feelings, and so they engage in illegal acts, lying to or conning other people. They're impulsive, they're reckless, they're irritable, and they're aggressive. They tend to see the world as self-serving and unkind, so they lack empathy and they can appear superficially charming, but they, attend, they attend to accomplish their goals through cruelty. It's much more common in males. There's a three to one ratio of men to women and adoption studies clearly demonstrate that the development of antisocial behavior is determined by the interaction of genetic factors and adverse environmental circumstances. Let's finish out with disorders in childhood. So neurodevelopmental disorders involve developmental problems in personal, social, academic, and intellectual functioning. ADHD, or Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, is when a child shows a constant pattern of inattention and or hyperactive and impulsive behavior that interferes with normal functioning. Boys are three times more likely to have ADHD, However, such findings might reflect the greater propensity of boys engaging in aggressive and antisocial behavior. What are the causes? Well, family and twin studies indicate that genetics play a significant role in the development of ADHD. The concordance rate for identical twins is 0.66. People with ADHD show less dopamine activity in key regions of the brain, especially those associated with motivation and reward. And here's something to keep in mind. ADHD is not caused by bad parenting. What about autism? Well, it's characterized by an inability to form close emotional ties with others, speech and language abnormalities, repetitive behaviors, and an intolerance for minor changes in environment and normal routine. Repetitive patterns of behavior may exhibit uh, or be exhibited in a number of ways. So they may rock, bang their head, or repeatedly drop something and then pick it up. They might also learn and memorize every detail about something, even though doing so serves no apparent purpose. Previous editions of the DSM included, included something called Asperger's disorder, and that's a less severe form of autistic disorder. Uh, 
these children tended to have average or high intelligence and a strong vocabulary, but had limited, uh, were limited in social interaction and social communication. But research failed to show that Asperger's was qualitatively different from autism, and so it was dropped. What are the causes of autism? Well, it's five times more common in boys, and rates have increased dramatically since the 1980s. The causes remain unknown, but appear to be influenced by genetics. So the concordance rates in identical twins are between 60 and 90%. In the late 1990s, a medical journal claimed that autism was triggered by the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine. Now, it was retracted, but the effects were long-lasting on attitudes and beliefs. And so some people don't vaccinate their children because they're afraid of autism. There is no scientific evidence that a link exists between autism and vaccination. So folks, please vaccinate your kids. Well, all of your problems, or at least all of your APA style problems, can be solved by using my Learn APA style book and videos. So when you want to learn to write correctly or write right, consult my book and videos on Learn APA style, which are about writing in psychology and the social sciences. Have a great day, and thanks for listening.